It's uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce the uh, Lou Church Memorial Lecturer. I just now met him. He has a very firm sh handshake. Uh, there's a lot more to say, though. Uh, uh, Francis J. Beckwith is Professor of Philosophy, Affiliate Professor of Political Science, and Associate Director of the Graduate Program in Philosophy at Baylor University, where he also serves as Resident Scholar in Baylor's Institute for Studies of Religion. Uh, with his appointment in the Department of Philosophy, he also teaches in several other academic units of the university, including political science, religion, and medical humanities. He's the author of over 100 academic articles, book chapters, reference entries, and reviews. Among his over 20 books are Never Doubt Thomas, The Catholic Aquinas as Evangelical and Protestant, published in 2019 by Baylor University Press, as well as Defending Life, a moral and legal case against abortion choice, and taking rights seriously, law, politics, and the reasonableness of faith, um, both published by Cambridge University Press. The, uh, the, the latter book won the um, American Academy of Religions prestigious 2016 Book Award for Excellence in the Study of Religion in Constructive Reflective Studies a graduate of, of the Washington University of Law in St. Louis and Fordham University, where he earned his MA and PhD in philosophy. He has held visiting faculty appointments at the University of Colorado at Boulder, the University of Notre Dame, and Princeton University. Uh, the topic he'll address us on today is taking rights seriously, neither theocracy nor liberal hegemony. May I introduce Frank Beckworth. Thank you, Joe. It's a, it's a, it's a delight to be here. Uh, I have never been to a Mises conference before, although I began my career at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas in 1989, and it was at that time that I became very close friends with both Murray Rothbard and Hans Hoppe, and have, over the years, obviously kept in contact with what uh, you all are doing here, and have, uh, just over the past hour or so, have been reintroduced to several of my former students who are also students of, of Murray and Han. So it's a delight to be here. And when Joe asked me to give this lecture, I told him that I was just a philosopher with a law degree and not an economist. Uh, but uh, I said that I'd been giving some thought about issues concerning the state and religious liberty uh, and uh, questions about uh, religious practices and the sorts of questions that have been raised over the past decade or so, or so about religious liberty, especially in American law. Uh, I also uh, am going to, in, in this lecture, so I told Joe, I'm gonna, uh, and he said, that's fine, deal with that. And so uh, I'm gonna be talking about some of those issues. Uh, but something else uh, that has struck me over the past uh, couple of years, and that has to do with what I see is uh, the rise of something called Catholic integralism. And I'm going to bring up in my lecture what I think Catholic integralism has in common with a kind of hegemonic liberalism. And to bring to bear on this question are going to be some things uh, that, that I've read uh, in, in Thomas Aquinas. And so I, I was delighted uh, er, uh, earlier in the conference to see that, that Doug Rasmussen uh, injected into this conference St. Thomas Aquinas. And I was thinking when preparing my lecture, uh, this is going to seem really different, but I guess it's not going to be all that different given that Aquinas has already been talked about. And I guess there was also another lecture as well. Let me explain the title, Taking Rights Seriously. I, I, I got the title from a article authored by Paul Whiteman uh, at the University of Notre Dame. He published an article in the late 90s called Taking Rights Seriously, R-I-T-E-S, and it's a play on the book by Ronald Dworkin, Taking Rights Seriously, R-I-G-H-T-S. And you can take titles without violating copyright. <laughs> so I, I did take the title, and I gave Paul credit uh, in, in the acknowledgments to my book with the same title. Uh, one of the good things about the title is that when you type in Dworkin's title in Google, mine comes up once in a while as a correction. 
So, uh, so I, I, I had an inadvertent, um, uh, inadvertent uh, marketing, uh, which I did not intend. So when I talk about uh, rights, uh, I'm, re I'm referring to those religious practices that a religious believer typically believes are connected to uh, in some way uh, or another with something transcendent and cannot be fully accounted for or fully understood by our ordinary descriptions. So for example, baptism is not merely another word for physically encountering H2O, but an act by which one participates in the divine life. But what, hap but what happens though when the state in the name of equality, eliminates that understanding from consideration when assessing whether a citizen has a right not to participate in such an activity. But, but suppose the state were a theocratic one, a state uh, that resists the citizen's right by appealing to its divine mission rather than to some liberal understanding of equality. What got me thinking about these questions uh, were three incidents. Uh, one, uh, really not so much an incident, but a, a cluster of, of cases that uh, many of you are probably familiar with. The most famous is the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. Uh, there are several of these cases that found themselves in lower uh, courts, state courts, and uh, uh, state appellate courts throughout the United States. They involve uh, several uh, family-owned, closely held businesses that refused to cooperate with the celebration of same-sex wedding ceremonies in apparent violation of their state's public accommodations, anti-discrimination laws. And in all the cases, the, uh, the parties argued uh, based on their religious liberties. And in every single case, they lost with the exception of uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop, which did win in the Supreme Court, but based largely on the fact that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission that assessed the case had said disparaging things about Jack Phillips the baker, not based on any sort of, of you know, that, that he sort of had an, a right to reject uh, uh, the business. So that was the first thing that sort of made me think about this, the, 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 those questions. The second, in, the second incident was an article that appeared in the journal First Things in 2018. It, it was authored by Father Romano Cesario, a Dominican priest, and in his article, he argues that Pope Pius IX in the 1850s was justified in kid kidnapping a Jewish child from his parents because the child had been baptized a Catholic. The third incident was Mary, Dr. Mary McAleese's 2019 Edmund Burke lecture at Trinity College Dublin in which she argues from the perspective of a Catholic progressive that Catholic parents who baptize their children violate the religious liberty rights of those children as defined by the United Nations. So in this talk, what I'm gonna argue is that none of these three takes rights seriously. In the case of the American courts, they don't take rights seriously because they completely eliminate from our view or their view, how religious citizens think of their own beliefs and practices. In the case is of Cesario and Macalese, they don't take rights seriously because they both reject the demands of natural justice, which ironically is taught by the very church whose teachings they both claim to follow. So first, I wanna just talk about the, the, these, these um, accommodation cases. So let's consider a story. So let's consider the story, a fictional case of somebody I call Joel Goldberg, owner of Goldberg's Photography, whose employees consist of Goldberg, his wife and two children, all of whom are Orthodox Jews. Located in Denver, Colorado, the business has never run afoul of any of the region's anti-discrimination laws, and he has earned a reputation of not turning away any customers because of their religion, race, gender, sexual orientation or nationality. Imagine that Goldberg is approached by a local Christian minister, we'll call him Mr. Convert, to take photographs at the church's upcoming biennial baptismal ceremony. The minister informs Goldberg that the church plans to post the photographs on its website as a way to publicly welcome the baptized into the community. Goldberg then asks, by the way, what is the name of your church? 
Mr. Convert answers, Rocky Mountain, Jews for Jesus. He goes on to tell Goldberg that it is a Christian congregation consisting exclusively of converts from Judaism, including several people that were members of Mr. Goldberg's synagogue. <laughs> Goldberg is not pleased by this, so he tells Mr. Convert, I'm sorry, but I will not cooperate with the celebration of a liturgical event that I believe is apostasy. He goes on to explain to Mr. Convert that he would have no problem photographing, um, uh, photographing the same individuals near in any, near in or any body of water, including being playfully dunked by any Christian minister or layman. But baptisms, he argues, because they are liturgical, are different, and most especially so when they involve the public renunciation by others of one's own faith. This activity, Goldberg emphatically tells Mr. Convert, is one in which I cannot participate. Not pleased with this news, Mr. Convert files a complaint with the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, arguing that Goldberg's refusal constitutes unlawful discrimination based on religion. At trial, Goldberg insists that it is not Mr. Go Mr. Convert's religion that is the issue, but rather the activity for which Mr. Convert is asking Goldberg to employ his artistic gifts to assist in celebrating. This activity, argues Goldberg, has deep liturgical significance for both himself and Mr. Convert. For Mr. Con for, for Mr. Convert, it's done in obedience to his faith. For Goldberg, it is a public act of apostasy and disobedience of the Torah. And yet the Colorado Civil Rights Commission rules against Goldberg, stating, quote, the Supreme Court has recognized that in some cases, conduct cannot be divorced from status. This is so when the conduct is so closely correlated with the static that it is engaged in exclusively or predominantly by persons who, ha who have that particular status. We conclude that the act of baptism constitutes such conduct because it is engaged in exclusively or predominantly by Christians. Therefore, Goldberg's distinction between not serving Christians and not cooperating with the celebration of a baptism is one without a difference. But for his religion, Mr. Convert, Convert would not have sought to baptize his congregants. And but for his intent to do so, Goldberg would not have denied Mr. Convert his services, unquote. By ignoring the liturgical significance of baptism to both those who believe in it and those who don't, that is by treating it as just another activity closely correlated with a citizen's protected status under the law, our fictional commission is not only not taking rights seriously, it is effectively redescribing a liturgical practice in terms alien to the citizens, both believers and non-believers, who indeed do take the practice seriously. Under the dominant progressive understanding of equality, the state is obligated under its anti-discrimination laws to punish Goldberg for his refusal of service, even though the only way for him to avoid punishment, in the words of John Locke, is to, quote, join in the worship and ceremonies of another church, unquote. But this seems to be the platonic ideal of a violation of religious liberty that writers like Locke, John Milton, Roger Williams, Madison, and Jefferson had in mind. I should note at this point that the imagined holding of the Colorado Civil Rights Commission is taken nearly word for word with just minor adjustments to fit the fictional case from the very real Colorado Court of Appeals ruling in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, ultimately decided in favor of the vendor by the US Supreme Court in June of 2018. In that case, the baker, Jack Phillips, owner of Masterpiece, refused to make a custom wedding cake for a same-sex couple who had planned to use the cake as, for a reception celebrating uh, uh, the wedding that had occurred in Massachusetts. As in the fictional baptism case, the Colorado court rejected the defendant's argument that his refusal of service was not based on the status of the customers, but rather on the nature of the ceremony that he was asked to employ his talents to help celebrate. It seems to me that the ruling of the Colorado court does indeed make sense, but only if one redescribes weddings in a way that eliminates their religious dimension that is integral to the observant citizen's worldview. For someone like Jack Phillips, a devout Christian, weddings, even when they are conducted under the auspices of institutions, either governmental or religious, 
that are outside of his own faith tradition have in fact liturgical significance. When he reads his own Bible, he is told that Christ's relationship to the church is analogous to the marriage between a man and a woman, adultery is prohibited by the Ten Commandments, and so forth. If he were to read the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which he probably doesn't because he's an evangelical Protestant, he would find that the church teaches that marriage has a special place in the created order that cannot be fully grasped by natural reason. If he were to examine the histories of not only his own faith, but other religious groups, he would discover how many of them have developed over the centuries sophisticated and complex rules by which to determine whether a marriage entered into by any of its followers under civil law or the authority of another religious group counts as a real marriage in the eyes of God. Thus, for religious believers like Phillips, weddings are more like baptisms, bar mitzvahs, and burials than they are like birthday parties, baby showers, or barbecues. It took me a while to come up with. <laughs> it kind of rolls off the tongue. This type of analysis is relatively easy to formulate if one makes an effort to understand how most religious believers see their own faith. They typically do not see it as just another exercise of individual autonomy, consonant with their own vision of the good life, as the sort of description that you hear in, in sort of contemporary political liberal thinkers like John Rawls, Ronald Dworkin, and, and so forth. Um, they see it as a discrete category of living that places them under the authority of a sovereign that may at times demand obedience contrary to the mandates of their culture. Although claiming to treat everyone with equal dignity and respect, the political liberal engages in a kind of eliminative strategy. That is, one of the essential features of sort of the, the kind of the liberal project is to eliminate, at least in terms of what I mean by liberalism is this sort of this recent project coming out of the 60s and 70s by some of the thinkers that I've already mentioned. Uh, what they are attempting to do is to try to, a kind of easy way to account for religion under some other general category. And so you'll typically find um, uh, attempts to treat uh, the exercise of a religious practice in, in some way analogous to a secular practice. The difficulty as I'm arguing here, is that there just seems to be some religious practices that don't, can't be sort of placed in a category like that, right? So, so for example, if you were to, supposing you, you wanted to account for something like the, the Car College of Cardinals, you, you could say, oh, the, the College of Cardinals are an all-male group like the New York Yankees, <laughs> right? And you, but that really wouldn't capture what exactly how they understand themselves, right? So there's, a, there's actually a, a Supreme Court case uh, uh, came out, it was about six or seven years ago, maybe, maybe 2015, 2014. Uh, it, it was a case involving a young woman that was uh, applying for a job at Abercrombie and Fitch. She was a Muslim woman and she uh, refused, uh, th th she, got, she was gonna get hired, but uh, Abercrombie and Fitch had a certain look and so they said that she couldn't wear her headscarf. Uh, she sued under the Civil Rights Act of 64. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the court winds up ruling in her, in her favor. Now, of course, you know, we can debate questions about whether you know, these sorts of, of laws are a good thing. But what's really interesting, though, is that, uh, that if, if you asked this woman about the nature of her headscarf, she wouldn't say that, that, it, that, it, that it, it's a kind of appeal to her right to wardrobe. Right. So, so if you, I, this, I had a professor at University of Miami Law School in a debate I had about religious liberty actually used that as an analogy. She said, oh, in that case, you don't need a sort of separate religious liberty. All you need is a right to wardrobe. And, and, and I just said, I don't think that truly captures what that woman's objection. Her objection was that she believed that God told her. And it's not, a, it's not, that's not like a question of, oh, should I choose Saks Fifth Avenue or The Gap? <laughs> it's not that kind of question. Right, but there's this tendency, at least in contemporary liberal thinking, and here I'm talking about people like Dworkin and Rawls, to try to find some sort of general category to sort of make, kind of domesticate religion, to treat it in a way that can be accounted for in something that's manageable. Right, this sort of egalitarian impulse to sort of level everything, and I call it an eliminative strategy because it eliminates from our vision those aspects of religion that actually are doing the work. I think, at least in terms of people that are devout. 
so, uh, so, so for one example, so Rawls, uh, at one point in, in, in his book, Political Liberalism, uh, Rawls refers to free, uh, uh, that, that's, uh, that, the, the, that faith can be sort of put underneath the category of, uh, that citizens regard themselves as self-originating sources of valid claims. And it's a weird way to put it for a religious citizen because the person that claims that something's a matter of conscience, they don't think of those claims sort of originating with them, right? It's, it's something that is a demand placed on them. All right, I want to move on now. So that's a very quick overview of, of, of why I, I think that at least the way in which uh, contemporary political liberals think of religion is problematic when it comes to rights. I want to move on now to uh, from weddings to baptisms and the uh, Catholic integralism of Father Cesario and the Catholic progressivism of Dr. McAleese. So Romano uh, Cesario and Dr. McAleese uh, uh, seem to hold, uh, at least superficially, contrary positions on the rights and obligations of the Catholic Church in relation to baptized children. Father Cesario in defense of Pope Pius IX's abduction of Edgardo, Edgardo Matara, argues that the Catholic Church has the right to exercise by means of political power, its obligations to educate and catech catechize baptized children of non-Catholic parents, even if the children's parents wish otherwise. On the other hand, Dr. McAleese argues that the Catholic Church does not have the right to exercise its obligations to educate and catechize baptized children insofar as those obligations are contrary to the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child. At first glance, it may appear that Father Cesario and Dr. McAleese are in disagreement. However, upon further reflection, or so I will argue, one discovers that their views share a foundational premise. They both maintain that considerations of natural justice may not trump whatever a governing authority. For Father Cesario, it's the Papal States, and for Dr. McAleese, it's the United Nations. Whatever that authority declares is in the best religious interest of the child. To show why this is so, I, I will first explain what I mean by natural justice as it pertains to parents, children, and religious formation. And here I will rely on the writings of Thomas Aquinas, whose work in this area both summarizes and expands on the church's most ancient teachings on that matter, even though the church itself and its theologians from time to time have not lived up to those teachings. I then move on to present and critically assess uh, what Cesario and Macaulay's say. Uh, and I use several counterexamples and illustrations to do so. So although the term natural justice has a variety of meanings, in this talk, I'm using it as a kind of shorthand way for what is often called the natural law, those moral principles derived from the human goods to which we are ordered by nature and on which our moral judgments rest, or at least that's the way in which Macaulay's and Cesario think of the natural law. Now, whether they, they, I, I'm going to argue that they, they're getting it wrong, uh, but that's, that's the way in which they would typically understand it. Natural justice in this sense is pre-conventional, meaning that it is the philosophical basis and not the deliverance of the positive law. In his presentation of the natural law, Thomas Aquinas uh, provides a brief account of what he calls the precepts of the natural law. Because we are rational animals and not creatures directed by mere instinct, we have intellects that apprehend these goods to which human beings are naturally ordered, that our wills ought to choose. So the first precept of the natural law is that good is to be done and pursued and evil is to be avoided. This Aquinas argues from the first principle of practical reason that good is that which all things seek after. He goes on to say that all our precepts of the natural law are based upon the first precept and that whatever practical reason naturally apprehends as one's good belongs to the precepts of the natural law as something to be done and, and or avoided. Among these precepts are those that pertain to, quote, sexual intercourse, education of offspring, and so forth, unquote. Aquinas maintains that practical reason naturally apprehends the moral truth that parents have an obligation to advance the well-being of their children, including their education and religious practice. 
This follows, Aquinas explains elsewhere, from the causal and protective roles that father and mother play in the origin and early development of their child. Just as our inclination to know tells us that we are ordered toward the good of knowledge and that ignorance is to be avoided, our inclination toward the conjugal act tells us that, that it and its pro procreative end are good, that the authority and responsibility of parents is also good, and that any acts contrary to those goods ought to be avoided. As should be evident, Aquinas' understanding of inclination uh, depends on a teleological view of nature, and that's contested. A lot of people reject that. Uh, according to Aquinas, this rightness or wrongness of certain acts uh, are judged by the end to which the agent is ordered by nature. So it, it, even though you, you find a lot of folks rejecting this, it kind of comes out in different ways, right? So um, I had a student actually at UNLV uh, back in the, in the 90s who once asked me whether the truth was important, and I asked her if she wanted the true answer or the false one. <laughs> Right. So I mean, there's a so so what a, a so what so when a so when Aquinas is talking about inclination, he's not talking about instinct or sort of visceral. He's talking about a kind of sense of of what we know about the flourishing and perfection of our powers, right? Um, all right. So uh, when it comes, if let's say, for example, uh, concerning parents, uh, someone like Aquinas would say it would be morally wrong for parents to neglect their children's physical and mental health by allowing them to indulge without limit, let's say, on Pepsi Cola, M and M's, and online video games, or to enroll them into Mr. Fagan's school of pickpocketry in lieu of, uh, of ordinary education. It is in the second part of the second part of the Summa in which Aquinas addresses in greater detail the authority and responsibility of parents when he answers the question, quote, whether the children of Jews and other unbelievers ought to be baptized against their parents' will. Aquinas in his response, he gives a five-pronged response. Actually, the, the way it works in the Summa, he begins with a, a question and then uh, has uh, uh, certain objections, and then has uh, has this thing called the said contra on the contrary, and then uh, responds to each one of the objections. And uh, usually, uh, his responses to the his the respondeo and his responses to the objections are what Aquinas actually thinks. The so said contra most of the time, uh, but his response is he's got five different responses. Uh, but I'm going to focus on on one uh, in particular uh, and just talk a little bit about the the other. So Aquinas points out, as, as one of the two answers, he says, quote, it was never the custom of the church to baptize the children of the Jews against the will of their parents. And as I said, he gives two reasons for this, or at least two reasons I'm going to cover. First, he says, it poses a danger to the faith. He says, quote, for children baptized before coming to the use of reason, afterwards when they come to perfect age, might easily be persuaded by their parents to renounce what they had no unknowingly embraced, and this would be detrimental to the faith, unquote. It's important to note here that Aquinas is assuming that the natural parents and not the church or a Catholic family are raising the children baptized against the will of the parents. In other words, it does not seem to occur to Aquinas as it did to Pius IX in the Matura case and numerous other prelates and scholars in church history that the baptized children of non-Catholics should be forcibly removed from their non-Catholic parents and brought up by and as Catholics. Elsewhere in the Summa, when dealing with the faith of unbelieving parents whose children have been baptized, Aquinas assumes that the unbelieving parents will be raising and caring for their baptized children. Aquinas never suggests that the church ought to take custody of such baptized children and find for them Catholic homes in which they may be properly catechized. The second reason for the church's custom of not baptizing children is that it would be, according to Aquinas, contrary to natural justice. It is on this point that Aquinas offers his natural law account of parental autonomy and responsibility. And this is what he says. I'm going to quote here from, from a paragraph in the Summa. Quote, for a child by nature, by, is by nature part of its father. Thus, at first, it is not distinct from its parents as to its body, so long as it is enfolded within its mother's womb, and later on after birth, and before it has the use of its free will. 
It is enfolded in the care of its parents, which is like a spiritual womb. For so long as man has not the use of reason, he differs not from an irrational animal, so that even as an ox or a horse belongs to someone who, according to the civil law, can use them when he likes, so according to the natural law, a son before coming to the use of reason is under his father's care. Hence, it would be contrary to natural justice if a child before coming to the use of reason were to be taken away from its parents' custody or anything done to it against its parents' wishes. As soon, however, as it begins to have the use of its free will, it begins to belong to itself and is able to look after itself in matters concerning the divine or the natural law. And then it should be induced, not by compulsion, but by persuasion to embrace the faith. It can then consent to the faith and be baptized even after its parents' wish, but not before it comes to the use of reason." Unquote. So there are several points that stand out in this passage. First, a child belongs to its parents as a matter of nature, a claim that Aquinas no doubt derives from the primary precepts of the natural law. Secondly, pa parents have the right and responsibility to act on behalf of their pre-rational children. So we, we would probably use language, say, like the age of reason or the age of accountability. Given what Aquinas says in the articulation of his first reason, that baptism against parental consent poses a danger to the faith, this parental right and responsibility is not superseded by the church if a child is in fact baptized against the parent's wishes. And third, after a child reaches the age of accountability, they can of course make their own decision. So let's move on now to Father Cesario. So I'm going to talk about Father Cesario's argument in First Things and then move to very quickly to Mary McAuley's argument and then open up the floor uh, for some questions. So in February 2018, um, Father Cesario published a piece uh, in First Things uh, called, uh, it was actually a book review of a book called Kidnapped by the Vatican, question mark, the unpublished memoirs of Edgardo Motera. Motera was born in 1851 into a Jewish family in Bologna, which was at the time a city in the Papal States. In 1858, he was forcibly taken from his parents to be brought up in the Vatican after it was discovered by the authorities that he had been secretly baptized five years earlier by the family's domestic, Anna Morisi. By the way, Steven Spielberg is actually making a movie on this. I don't know if you know. Um, I'm sure Pius IX will not look good, I suspect. Uh, uh, <laughs> as probably he shouldn't. Um, so uh, under canon law, child baptisms against uh, parents' wishes are ordinarily illicit, though valid. Illicit, though valid, means you shouldn't do it, but if you do it, it's got to count. That, that's what it means, right? So um, however, if Maurice was right about uh, Mortura's imminent demise, that he was near death, under canon law, the baptism was both licit and valid. Canon law does say a child can be baptized against the parents' wishes if death is imminent. Because uh, Cesario reasons, the sacrament of baptism reconfigures the baptized to Christ by an indelible mark, indelible character. Little Edgardo, in the eyes of the church, became the Catholic, a Catholic the moment he was baptized. Canon law also teaches that parents of Catholic children have an obligation to raise them in the Catholic faith, and that the duty and right of educating belongs in a special way to the church, to which has been divinely entrusted the mission of assisting persons so that they are able to reach the fullness of the Christian faith. So based on these premises, Father Cesario comes to Pio Nono's defense, arguing that Pius IX really had no choice, for given the nature of the Catholic sacramental worldview, and that Motora is entitled to a Catholic upbringing that his parents refused to provide, the Papal States were justified under its civil law in kidnapping the young child, relocating him, and placing him under the guardianship of Pius IX. And Motora, by the way, actually became a Catholic priest and in his autobiography defended Pius IX. Well, by the way, it's not, even, it's not entirely clear, though, whether... Uh, Licitness is actually relevant to Father Cesario's case, right? So, I mean, if in fact there is an obligation for the parents to raise the child uh, in the Catholic faith, uh, if they're baptized, it seems to me that the licitness or illicitness of it wouldn't matter, right? 
But does it follow from the validity of the sacrament and the principles of canon law that the papal states were morally required to abduct Mortura from his family and permanently keep him in custody at the Vatican? By not addressing the natural law grounding of parental authority and responsibility, which is the focus of Aquinas' argument and the basis of the church's own teachings on the matter, Father Cesario leaves this question unanswered. He relies exclusively on canon law and the civil law of the papal states as if they could never be contrary to natural justice. For this reason, it leaves one to wonder the extent to which Father Cesario would think it permissible for the church to cooperate with the state to achieve the church's ends when the state is not under the authority of the Holy Father as it was in the papal states. Suppose, for example, a group of US Catholic hospital chaplains overly zealous about their faith, make a pact with each other to baptize children against the parents' wishes whenever possible, terminally little newborns, a tiny percentage of whom eventually recover. Under canon law, these baptisms are both listed and valid. But given Father Cesario's understanding of the correct application of the church's divinely entrusted mission, the local bishop should instruct their diocese general counsel to petition the family courts to issue injunctions and order the children's parents either to raise them in the Catholic faith or transfer custody to the bishop. If a secular court in the United States were to grant such an injunction, I'm not even suggesting that's even remotely plausible, <laughs> but I mean, imagine this is the logic of his position. That's, that's the point. We would clearly see it as an infringement of the parents' rights and thus a violation of natural justice. Making this point in response to the objection that, quote, every man belongs more to God from whom he has his soul than to his carnal father from whom he has his body. This was an objection raised uh, to, uh, to Aquinas' claim that it would be wrong to baptize the children. Aquinas writes, quote, a child before it has the use of reason it was ordained by God by a natural order through the reason of its parents under whose care it naturally lies. And it is according to their ordering that things pertaining to God are to be done in respect of the child, unquote. In response to another objection that asserts that the government may, without committing an injustice, force the baptism of Jewish children against their parents' wishes, Aquinas writes that whatever civil obligations Christian monarchs may place on their Jewish subjects, they cannot, quote, exclude the order of natural or divine law, unquote. Consequently, the fact that baptized Catholic children are entitled to a certain kind of spiritual formation and Catholic upbringing, and the fact that the church has a responsibility to educate all its baptized members, does not entail that the civil government, even when the government happens to be the Holy See, may do anything in its power to achieve that end. That the civil law cannot and must not in such cases be employed to achieve what every Catholic would see as an important uh, aspect of a child's development uh, is in line with Aquinas's point elsewhere in the Summa that the human law cannot repress every act of vice or command all the acts of every virtue. Because canon law and human law must answer to the natural law, Pius IX's kidnapping of Matura and the pontiff's refusal to return the young man to his parents, though permitted by the civil law of the papal states, was, in the words of St. Augustine, no law at all, even if the baptism was both licit and valid. Dr. McAleese, Dr. McAleese, uh, Mary McAleese is the former president of Ireland. She was president from 1997 to 2011 and about three years ago, four years ago, earned a doctoral degree in canon law from the Pontifical University, the Gregorian University, Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. And her dissertation dealt with this very issue. Uh, she subsequently uh, gave a lecture in uh, the Edmund Burke Lecture, of all uh, names, uh, uh, at, in November of 2019 at Trinity College, Dublin, in which she made this argument and it became uh, a point of controversy, at least for a couple of days, uh, in certain circles on the internet. So according to Dr. McAleese, in canon law, the rite of baptism has both a spiritual and juridical component. The former has the effect of eliminating original sin, while the latter has the effect of imposing on the child, quote, lifelong church membership which can never be rescinded, becoming subject to church laws from the age of seven, on reaching the use of reason, and being deemed by baptism to have made 
pers personal promises to fulfill the many onerous obligations canon law imposes on church members, unquote. This juridical component, argues Dr. McAleese, is a clear violation of Article 14 of the 1989 United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child, noting that the Holy See was one of the first state parties to sign up to the convention, unquote. Which you probably should read before you sign. Um, it's like when you get those things, you know, do you agree? Like you get an app, like, you know, like you say no, you just, that's it, right? You can't like negotiate, right? So Article 14, this is what Article 14 states. States parties shall respect the right of the child to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. State parties shall respect the rights and duties of the parents and when applicable legal, legal guardians to provide direction to the child in the exercise of his or her rights in a manner consistent with the evolving capacities of the child. Freedom to manifest one's religion or beliefs may be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary to protect public safety, order, health, or morals, or the fundamental rights and freedoms of others, unquote. Now, it would seem at first glance that there is nothing about Article 14 that is inconsistent with what Aquinas maintains are the parents' rights under natural justice to direct the religious beliefs and practices of their children prior to the age of accountability. Thus, it would seem that the Catholic baptism of infants does not run afoul of Article 14. I mean, I suspect... When the, when the church leaders signed that, they probably thought that as well, right? What they underestimated is the power of regulatory bureaucracies from reinterpreting legal instruments, right? And that's precisely what McAleese and others, I think, are, are trying to do. Um, she argues that because baptism's juridic component, which, can, which she attributes to man-made canon law, is realized by promises made by godparents and parents, uh, the right does not, in the words of Article 14, respect the right of the child for freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. According to Dr. McAleese, the Holy See has never considered the ethical, legal, and moral implications of imposing lifelong membership of the church and a body of obligations on a baby who is not in a position to weigh the implications. What are we to make of Dr. McAleese's argument? First, uh, her distinction between the spiritual and juridic elements of baptism, uh, the fact that you can distinguish them in your mind doesn't mean they can actually be distinguished in reality. Um, think, for example, of national citizenship. One can distinguish one, in one's mind between the act of becoming a citizen and the consequences of that citizenship, so like permanent residency status and so forth, right? I mean, there are, think about something like a triangle. You can distinguish the sides from the angles, but that doesn't mean you, they can actually exist apart from each other. In much the same way, at least in, in, in Catholic doctrine, and most Christian churches teach this as well, baptism places you within the body of Christ, and it's something that sort of is by, by its very nature happens. And so the, the sort of, yes, you can distinguish them, but that doesn't mean they can be separated from, each, from the, themselves ontologically. Now, I want to raise uh, uh, some questions about the way in which uh, I, well, I think I, I suspect what's really going on in McAleese's mind here. I, I think what she's really saying is something like this. Because the church has refused to embrace a sort of modern liberal view of the human person, that true human freedom is the exercise of the individual will unencumbered by inherited and or unchosen traditions and forms of life, the church's doctrine of baptism fails to measure up to the ethical, legal, and moral standards of the modern world that the church on occasion has championed. Her point is not without, not without merit, since, as she correctly notes, the church did indeed sign the 1989 United Nations Convention uh, on the Rights of the Child. But as I've already noted, it's not at all obvious that one must... Uh, read the document as contrary to Aquinas' account of natural justice. But why think that McAleese's interpretation of the convention's Article 14 is a sufficient reason for the church, or any other religious body for that matter that holds to a similar view, abandon its understanding of the sacrament of baptism? She actually never tell, tells us. She just assumes as normative the modern liberal view in her interpretation of international human rights law. Why should the church suppose that the modern world has better insights into philosophical anthropology than its own traditions and theology. After all, it is not as if the modern liberal view of the person is not without 
its own problems and puzzles. It does not seem possible, for example, for flesh and blood human beings to seriously think that what is constitutive of their lives, those enduring loyalties and attachments to family, nation, faith, and tradition that they do not explicitly choose somehow diminishes rather than informs how they ought to exercise their liberty. Think of the millions of unsuspecting infants who every year are born into families that speak a language, live under a constitution and body of laws, participate in formal education with a uni uniform curriculum, and engage in cultural practices they inherited from their predecessors, all of which provide order, purpose, and meaning so that the child may exercise her will freely and not capriciously once she reaches the age of reason. Are we to actually believe that the rights of, those, of these infants are violated because these attributes and practices, some indelible or nearly so, are foisted upon them without their explicit consent? Dr. McAleese herself seems to tacitly and thus ironically accept this reality when she presents the deliverances of international human rights conventions as normative for all the world's citizens, even though virtually none of those citizens has explicitly consented to the true human freedom that she believes these conventions teach. These citizens are born into and brought up in a world already configured with authoritative commissions, conventions, governments, constitutions, statutes, etc., which no doubt, under Dr. McAleese's understanding, properly instruct these citizens as to what counts as true human freedom. Take, for example, the Catholic adult whose parents live under a government that has placed in its laws Dr. McAleese's understanding of international human rights and thus prohibits Catholic baptisms. Imagine this adult now wishes that her parents had baptized her as an infant and inculcated in her the lessons of faith that Dr. McAleese maintains are deleterious to true human freedom. This adult was not nor could ever be a party to the original legislative agreement that banned her parents from asking the church on her behalf to give her the sacrament. Yet that child, as with all children in Dr. McAleese's ideal state, must live under its rules, rules to which they did not explicitly consent. Not surprisingly, when she discusses the Mortura case, Dr. McAleese does not describe it as a violation of natural justice, but rather as the church through its political power imposing itself on little Edgardo and his parents and inflicting on them deep emotional pain. Completely absent from her analysis is recognition of the right of Edgardo's parents under natural justice to inculcate in their child their religious faith, which includes in Judaism circumcision, a right that most certainly left indelible mark on their son. <laughs> For if she had brought that insight to the reader's attention, one could raise the following questions about her case against Catholic infant baptism. Why is it permissible, as Dr. McAleese argues, for the modern liberal state with its assorted human rights instruments to impose on Catholic parents an understanding of the sacramental life that forces them to cease baptizing their children until their church officially detaches the juridical effects of baptism from its spiritual effects, which, as I've already noted, is ontologically impossible. If it was an injustice for the papal states to kidnap little Edgardo unless his parents agreed to the conditions to raise him Catholic, why is it not an injustice for the modern liberal state as Dr. McAleese suggests, to tell Catholic parents they have a right to baptize their children only under the condition that their church abandon its sacramental theology. If it is wrong, as Dr. McAleese claims, for the Catholic Church to teach, as it did in the 19th century, that it is the world's sole spiritual and temporal source of governance, then why is it right in the 21st century for international human rights conventions and commissions to be posited as the sole source of what counts as legitimate spiritual practices? It does not take much imagination to conclude from Dr. McAleese's reasoning that if the eradicating of unchosen Catholic baptisms is a matter of vindicating human rights, then it stands to reason that government should legally proscribe Catholic infant baptisms in order to protect the victimized children from this terrible injustice. The main problem with Dr. McAleese's view is that it is indistinguishable from the one held by Father Cesario. Both defend policies that offend natural justice. For Father Cesario, because a young boy's right to salvation hangs in the balance, the state, under the direction of the Holy See, may separate a child from the religious direction of his parents until he reaches the age of reason. For Dr. McAleese, because a child's right to true human freedom hangs in the balance, the state, under the guidance of the United Nations, may separate him from the religious direction of his parents until he reaches the age of reason. Now, a critic of this paper could raise the objection, why should one accept that there's such a thing as natural justice? Perhaps the only law that exists is the positive law. 
That's certainly a good question, uh, but one relevant, not relevant to at least the part of the paper in which I dealt with this issue. My point is simply to show how the reasoning of both Father Sisterio and Dr. McAleese, though seemingly worlds apart ideologically, is oddly parallel insofar as they both reject natural justice. So you can say then that the views of Father Cesario and Dr. Dr. McAleese are twins separated at baptism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.